Thanks to Skillshare for supporting this episode of SciShow Psych. The first 1,000 people to click the link in the description can get a one-month free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. Watching movies and TV can help us escape from the chaos of everyday life. And we love movies, but sometimes we aren't really paying attention to every single detail. For example, did you notice something change in the middle of Pretty Woman? Here's what you might have missed. Have you ever seen the movie North by Northwest? There's a moment in the background where a little boy plugs his ears right before a gun goes off. And in Pretty Woman, Julia Roberts is eating a croissant in one shot and a pancake in the next. Little mistakes like these are in almost every movie you've ever seen, but you've probably never noticed them, even though they're right there on the screen in front of you. It's weird. You'd think noticing things that are out of place would be an evolutionary advantage, but it turns out that our brains aren't actually that good at perceiving things. It's more than your eyes recording whatever's going on in front of them, your brain has to interpret the image they produce. And when it prioritizes what it thinks is important, sometimes you don't notice what's right in front of your face. You can miss more than just small mistakes. In a famous experiment conducted in 1999, subjects watched a short video of two groups of people tossing around a basketball. Some wore white clothes and the others wore black clothes. The subjects were asked to count the number of times the players wearing a particular color passed the ball. But while they were busy counting, a person wearing a gorilla suit walked right through the shot, thumped her chest, and walked off. About half of the subjects didn't notice the gorilla walk through at all. If you've taken the test and didn't notice it either, don't feel bad. Your brain was busy at the time. When you don't notice an unexpected change because you're focusing on something else, that's called inattentional blindness. And it can tell you a lot about how our brains process the world around us. When you're focusing on something, your brain will automatically filter out information it thinks is irrelevant. So when you're concentrating on counting people passing a basketball, your brain ignores everything else, even a gorilla walking across the screen. Something similar happens when you're watching a movie where there's a mistake. Your brain focuses your attention on the most important things, and a little boy plugging his ears in the back of the room isn't as important as the main character in mortal danger right in front of you. Your brain kinda has to pick something to focus on because even though our eyes have a pretty wide field of view, they can only focus on a very small area at a time. Eye tracking experiments have shown that we tend to focus our gaze on other people's hands and faces two huge sources of information when we communicate with each other. And yet, in Pretty Woman, Julia Roberts was holding a croissant in her hand in one shot, which turned into a pancake in the next. If your brain considers hands and faces important, you think you'd notice something changing in her hand, but you don't because your brain also tries to correct for continuity errors. In 2014, researchers at UC Berkeley looked into this by asking subjects to match the orientation of a white bar to a black bar that flashed on the screen over and over again. But the subjects weren't very good at matching the angles of the bars. They tended to choose an angle that was an average of the three most recent bars they'd seen. The team suggested that this mistake is your brain trying to make sure your experience of reality has the same kind of continuity that you'd expect from a movie. Sometimes that involves blending your experiences over about 15 seconds to be as smooth as possible in what's known as a continuity field. So if the input from your eyes shows Julia Roberts' breakfast changing between shots, your brain will pretend it's just a glitch in the matrix and ignore it to keep you from being confused. Focusing like this can be really helpful when, say, you're trying to have a conversation with someone at a crowded, noisy party or follow the story and characters in a convoluted spy thriller. But it also means that sometimes you'll miss things that are right in front of you. It's a little unsettling that you can miss something as significant as a gorilla walking across your field of vision, and it's important to know that our brains work that way, especially when it comes to things like eyewitness testimony in court cases. But it's normal not to notice little mistakes in movies or even big, unexpected things. Your brain's just trying to make you see what it thinks you're supposed to see. So maybe you won't notice small details, but you definitely notice something big, like how similar Clark Kent and Superman look. Well, that's what we all think as we're watching the movie, but research suggests that we'd probably act just like the other citizens of Metropolis. Don't believe me? Watch this. According to superhero comics, simply putting on or taking off glasses is enough to completely transform your appearance. Suddenly, mild-mannered Clark Kent 
is Superman. And lots of people have claimed that that's ridiculous because a pair of glasses doesn't seem like enough to make someone unrecognizable. But researchers have actually looked into this because of course they have, and it turns out that thanks to the way our brains process faces, glasses can be enough to keep you from recognizing someone, especially a stranger. Which in a world full of photo IDs and eyewitness testimony is kind of a big deal. Faces are special to us humans because social interaction is key to our survival. They're so special, in fact, that your brain has entire systems dedicated to recognizing them. Some regions of your brain, like the occipital facial area, respond specifically to parts of the face, like the eyes or nose. Meanwhile, your fusiform gyrus responds to the whole face. It tells your brain what's what so that you know you're looking at a face and not a piece of toast or whatever. Other regions, like the superior temporal sulcus, respond to facial cues, emotional expressions, for example, or where the eyes are looking. But even so, a face isn't recognizable until you draw on your memories and experiences to contextualize it. Which is why it can be harder to recognize a person when something changes. You might not immediately recognize your boss at the grocery store, for example, or Superman wearing glasses. No, really! A 2016 study in the UK with 59 subjects found that glasses made it harder to tell if two images were of the same person. If both had glasses or both didn't have glasses, the participants could correctly tell if they were the same person about 80% of the time. But if one one had glasses and the other didn't, they were only able to tell if they were the same person 74% of the time. While that's not a huge difference, it was still a statistically significant change, and it shows that glasses can affect how easily you identify someone, especially a stranger. In addition to experiments like these, scientists often study how our brains recognize faces by looking at the outliers. Some people score way above normal on facial recognition tests. They're called super recognizers, and they are really, really good at identifying faces, even when they've been obscured or disguised, like with a hat or a mustache. And I am not one of them. And that might be because they focus more on the nose than other people do. Researchers think that looking right near the middle of the face, right around the nose, may help them process the face all at once rather than piece by piece. And looking at the face as a whole, rather than as an assembly of eyes and nose and mouth, seems to be an important part of actually recognizing who it is, rather than just seeing the face. So if you want to recognize people better just right at the nose. There are also people who are completely awful at recognizing faces as well. It's not just an excuse that people use at parties, I swear. In severe cases, it's called prosopagnosia, or face blindness, and it's surprisingly common. Studies suggest that about 2% of people might have it to some extent. It can be caused by an injury or disease, but many cases are congenital. In the immortal words of Lady Gaga, baby, they were born that way. People with prosopagnosia tend to be bad at recognizing faces no matter what. In congenital cases, it often seems to come from structural or signaling problems in the fusiform gyrus, the part of the brain that sees faces as a whole. In other words, they have trouble distinguishing faces as faces. For example, most people can more easily recognize an upright face than an inverted face, but people with prosopagnosia are always bad at it, no matter the orientation. And they spend more time looking at the mouth area than the eyes or the nose, which might explain why they can't match the face to memory. They're not looking at the right areas, and maybe they're not really seeing the whole face. Most of us are in between the extremes, okay at recognizing faces, especially ones you see all the time, but still not perfect. Which might not seem like a big deal until you think about all of the real-world situations where a person's ability to recognize faces can have some pretty serious consequences, like all the places we use photo IDs or in eyewitness testimony. On the other hand, people who are good at recognizing faces could be used to make things more secure. For example, the London Police Force has their own research-confirmed team of super-recognizers who help identify suspects from video footage. So part of the solution to these security issues might be to include recognition testing in the hiring process for jobs where facial recognition is important. We could also eventually let computers, which are constantly getting better at this, take over. Because sure, our brains have special areas for processing faces, but we're not as great at recognizing them as you might think. And ultimately, that's why Superman's disguise might actually be enough, despite all the flack it's received, as long as he can also hide all the bulging muscles. Which I don't know how he manages that. 
So you might not be able to fly like Superman, but maybe your superpower is recognizing that it's really Clark Kent. Or maybe it's learning a new skill. Today's sponsor, Skillshare, can help with that. They're an online learning community with a membership that gives you unlimited access so you can join the classes and communities that are just right for you. And all of your learning is uninterrupted because there's no ads on their platform, so you can follow wherever your creativity takes you. Like their course in indoor gardening, with spring slowly lurking in, you can take this course to brush up your skills on growing houseplants, veggies, and herbs. And what's more, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description get a one-month free trial of premium membership, and checking them out also helps us, so thanks. Now back to Superman. Many of us aren't watching Superman for the detective work of figuring out who he really is anyway. Lots of us just love that suspense right before Superman saves the day. And for similar reasons, we love horror movies. Imagine sitting in a dark theater, holding your breath as a slimy hand reaches toward an unsuspecting kid on screen. Or maybe your heart's pounding as a murderous ghost chases down some heroes. Horror movies are designed to make us scared, but if you're like me, you love them. Now, that seems kind of paradoxical. Fear is a negative feeling and can steer us away from bad situations in real life. So why do so many people watch horror? Psychologists have been asking this question for a while, and the answer is complicated because we all have different emotional needs and experiences, but they have some good guesses. One series of studies in 2012 by a researcher at the University of Augsburg in Germany surveyed people's reasons for watching movies and TV. She found that people sought out vicarious experiences. You can safely feel things that you might not experience in your everyday life, like excitement, danger, or fear through a car chase or a murder mystery. Movies also fulfilled other emotional and cognitive needs, like feeling thrilled, having fun, and sharing social experiences with others. But different people want want and need to feel different things. One way I might differ from my friend who hates horror movies is our need for affect. How strongly you like to feel emotions and how much you seek or avoid chances to feel them. A study of 119 moviegoers in 2010 found that the people who reported a higher need for affect also reported stronger emotions after seeing a horror movie. They had stronger feelings and they enjoyed the emotional experience more than people who'd rather avoid strong emotions. Relatedly, a 2005 meta-analysis of six studies showed that if people look for more intense and novel experiences, which is something psychologists call sensation-seeking, they tend to enjoy horror movies more. And this effect seems to start young. A study in 2010, for instance, showed some videos to 123 children that were around seven years old. It found that kids were more likely to choose to watch a scary shark video rather than a cute little bunny video if they had more sensation-seeking tendencies. Gender might also be a factor. In many studies, men have reported watching and enjoying horror movies more than women, especially if it's violent or gory. But gender roles seem to be just as important. Studies in the 1980s and 90s involving teenagers found they enjoyed the experience more when men showed mastery of fear and women showed sensitivity, which are stereotypical gender roles. There isn't much modern research involving gender roles in horror, so it'd be interesting to see if these patterns have changed at all. And then there's empathy. That 2005 meta-analysis also found that highly empathetic people, basically those who feel like the emotion on screen is contagious, don't enjoy horror movies as much. Which makes sense, since you'd be feeling the intense terror of the victims. Now, so far we've been talking about horror generally, but there are lots of different stories out there with different characters, monsters, and plots. So, some researchers hypothesize that the ending of movies might be what's important. Maybe watching the good guys win leads to enjoyment. An experiment in 2007 involved changing the ending of four horror movies so that the evil was destroyed or came back at the very end. The scientists had 229 college students watch a whole movie with one of the two endings and evaluate it. And people seemed to prefer movies where evil was defeated. But it wasn't as simple as, yay, the good guys won. For instance, some people said they liked the surprise of it. That Unlike many horror movies, it was a nice twist that the monsters didn't survive. It's worth mentioning that all these students wanted to see a horror movie, though, so their experience might not reflect the whole spectrum of moviegoers. And this study just asked about their general feelings. To understand in-the-moment emotions better, a different pair of researchers conducted a series of studies in 2007 that had people rate their emotions while they watched a four-minute scary scene from the movie Salem's Lot, rather than after the whole thing. In each study, they recruited roughly 80 young adults who said they either avoided watching horror movies or sought them out. They found that horror seekers weren't less scared than the avoiders, as some researchers predicted. Both groups showed similar negative emotions, but their positive emotions were different. The more fear the horror seekers experienced, the more positive emotions they experienced too. In other words, 
fear was fun, and they could feel both emotions at the same time. But for the avoiders, it was the opposite. More fear meant less fun. Plus, the studies found that this group felt happier only after the bad things ended. The researchers wondered if the seekers might enjoy scary things because of a protective network. That is, their brains do something that protects them from the bad parts of fear. To test this, they showed participants bios of the two main actors in the horror scene and kept their photos on the screen as a reminder that it was all fake. This time, although everyone reported feeling fear, both the seekers and the avoiders reported more positive emotions the more afraid they were. Everyone seemed to enjoy a good scare when they had a reality check. So you might love or hate horror movies for lots of different psychological reasons, some of which we might not fully understand. Maybe you feel as terrified as the characters hiding from a serial killer, which just kind of sucks. Or maybe, like me, you love to experience a zombie apocalypse from the safety of your couch. So at least to some extent, whether or not we enjoy horror movies depends on who we are. But that's not to say that people who enjoy watching Chainsaw Massacres are bad people. I mean, the characters in the movie are bad people doing bad things, but why do we like that? Everyone loves a good fictional villain. Whether it's the hero's sinister brother, primary foe, or creepy not mom, it seems like the worst characters in books, films, comics, and games often inspire as much empathy as they do enmity. And that's a little confusing because we tend to dislike real life baddies. But psychologists think they figured out why so many of us cheer on fictional terrible people when we shun real ones. And the answer might help us better understand how everyone in our lives real or fictional, shape how we think of ourselves and who we are. To understand our love of villains, we first have to understand how we see ourselves. In general, we human beings want to perceive ourselves as competent, compassionate, and, well, as good people. It's the reason we're likely to think that we'd always do what's right, even if others wouldn't. Like, we'd always leave a note if we hit a parked car. And we'd never hang the toilet paper in the under position because people in the under toilet paper camp are agents of chaos. Psychologists refer to the need to see ourselves as good as self-positivity bias. And it has a big impact on our actions and behaviors. For example, a team of American psychologists found that women whose first names are or resemble state names like Georgia, Virginia, or even Florence are 44% more likely to have lived in that state. They think that's because the women have positive personal associations with their first names. Basically, they subconsciously connected their identities to their namesake states. And because we would all like to think of ourselves as awesome, that made them more likely to think that that state was a good place to live. This phenomenon where we just naturally gravitate towards things that resemble us in some way is called implicit egotism. And it's essentially the flip side of what happens when we're confronted with real-life villains. When we encounter a bad person we share similarities with, like we read about a criminal who has the same name or job or whatever, our positive self-image can become threatened. So we distance ourselves from those people. And psychologists have demonstrated this in controlled studies. For instance, Researchers from Yale conducted an experiment where test subjects were given personality tests and then partnered with an undercover researcher. The participants were either told their personalities were similar or different from their partners. Then, they were asked to give their impressions of them. The trick is that, for some of the participants, the undercover researcher behaved pleasantly. For others, they were totally obnoxious. And what was interesting is that the participants' ratings of this researcher depended on whether they had been told they were similar to them. If so, then the researcher got higher scores for niceness when they acted nice and worse scores for unpleasantness when they acted like a jerk. The team concluded this was because negative qualities can be perceived as a self-threat, since they lead us to question our positive self-image. So if another person is obnoxious but also a lot like you, it makes you wonder if you're a little bit obnoxious too. But fictional villains don't work this way. Take the results of a study published in Psychological Science in April 2020, for instance. Researchers from Northwestern University analyzed data from Caricatur, a website that allows hundreds of thousands of registered users to take goofy personality quizzes to see which fictional characters they most resemble. Users can then become a fan of those characters, which is a lot like liking something on Facebook. 
Beast book. And each of these characters, whether heroic or villainous, is also assigned personality trait scores based on their fictional portrayals. So researchers could mathematically determine if characters and their fans share personality traits. The data revealed that people are actually drawn to villains that are similar to them, as they tended to share similar personality traits with the characters they were fans of. And this didn't just apply to good things like intelligence or charisma. Fans of villains were twice as likely to identify as selfish than the fans of heroes, and were disproportionately dishonest, manipulative, and rude. This is the opposite of what you'd expect if people were shying away from the bad characters that are similar to them, and much more like implicit egotism. The researchers think the fact that these villains are fictional makes all the difference. The idea is that in a story world, we're free to explore the darker sides of our personalities without having to worry if we're actually bad people. Because if the villain isn't real, then in a way, we can't really be like them, so similarities aren't a threat to our self-positivity bias. And this may extend beyond made-up villains. We also storify actual bad people like in true crime television shows documentaries, books, and podcasts, or even through reality television. That could give them an air of fictionality, allowing others to empathize with them or even support them without harming their self-image. Even before the character study, some psychologists thought the popularity of true crime shows stem from their ability to let us explore the dark side of human nature at a safe distance. Now, researchers have shown that our brains do make an exception of sorts when it comes to fictional people. So studying the edges of that exception could help us better better understand how our self-images, or even who we are, can be shaped by the media we consume, real or not. So movie villains really just help us understand ourselves better. Maybe they're doing more good than bad in the end, and that would mean that the worst people aren't the villains, but the writers who make bad finales. It was a refrain heard across the internet. Game of Thrones was so good! until that last season. Or How I Met Your Mother, until that last episode. Or pick any number of examples. There have just been so many times where a bad ending feels like it ruins the whole series. And it's not just because you're angry at the writers. There's actually some psychology there. Now, some of the explanation is pretty intuitive. Ending a relationship is hard, even if it's not a bad ending. And that's essentially what's going on here. When you really get into a TV show, book, or YouTuber, you might develop what psychologists call a parasocial relationship. It's a one inside a relationship with fictional characters or celebrities that you treat kind of like the real thing. These kinds of relationships can fulfill real social needs in what's called social surrogacy. Like we normally turn to our friends or family if we feel lonely or rejected. But watching a favorite TV show or even just thinking about TV characters you like can also fill those needs, and studies have demonstrated that. On the flip side, though, having parasocial relationships can also put you at risk for experiencing some real pain and sorrow. Like, after one protagonist in the TV show Game of Thrones died, we won't say which one, researchers looked at a sample of nearly a thousand tweets talking about it. And 93% of them fit into one of the stages of the Kubler-Ross grief model. That's a model therapists often use to describe a series of common reactions people have after the death of a loved one, including denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And the responses on Twitter even reflected some of the typical timing of each of those stages of grief. For example, depression reached its highest frequency in the middle of the sample period, then dropped off, and acceptance was at its highest at the end. This wasn't an isolated incident, either. After a character on the TV show House died, researchers studying online message boards found similar reactions. And even back when the TV show Friends ended, surveys of college students showed that those who felt a strong relationship to the characters reported feeling loneliness and distress in their absence. It was almost like a real breakup. Now, not everyone experiences this to the same extent. But what's clear from these studies is that we can form real relationships with fictional characters. And when they go away, the hurt can be real, too. So you might have some hard feelings surrounding the end of a show, no matter how good or bad it was. But a bad series finale can be especially painful. That has to do with a psychological phenomenon known as the peak-end rule. This rule describes the fact that there are two parts of experiences we remember better than others. The most intense moments, and the endings. And this is true for all sorts of experiences. Like, it's why one rainy day at the beach can cast a shadow on your whole vacation, or an unpleasant commute home can color your entire day. Researchers aren't sure why our brains do this, but one hypothesis is that the peaks and endpoints sort of 
frame the experience so we can remember how much emotional effort it would take to go through that again. All this means that a bad ending can loom larger than the rest of the show to begin with. But recalling that ending can also make matters worse. That's because when we recall these memories, we don't just play them back neutrally. Our brain reacts to our memories as we recall them to remind us whether or not it's an experience we want to repeat. In particular, one key part of the brain that gets involved is the insula. The insula sits deep in the brain, and it activates when you're recalling something that was rewarding at first, but then turned a little sour over time. So to use a non-TV example, say you're remembering the first time you ate shrimp. Maybe at first it seemed great, but then your lips started to puff up because apparently you're allergic and you regretted ever trying it. The next time you come across that food and remember your last encounter with it, the insula will activate to remind you how the last time went. And the same is true for consuming media. Researchers think the insula helps produce these gut feelings to keep us away from the types of experiences or situations that have hurt us in the past. And for some of us, that response to our memory can influence our feelings even more than the original event. So if you hear Game of Thrones and can't help but think of how much you hated the last season. That could be your insula trying to remind you how the series hurt you, so you don't rewatch it and get betrayed again. Especially because, if you've already developed a bond with its characters, that betrayal could feel pretty strong. But as frustrating as it is that our brains paint bad fictional endings as almost personal betrayals, it's ultimately because they're just looking out for us. That puts a lot of pressure on this outro, so I'll just keep it short and sweet. Thanks for watching this compilation of SciShow Psych. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did.